What up? I'm V and welcome to my channel where we talk about all things true crime and current events. Today is another episode of Crafty Crimes where you and I sit down together, we talk about something related to the true crime world, and we do a little crocheting at the same time. Today's case is a really interesting one and it's it's honestly very tragic. If you've watched my last two lives that I did, thank you first of all so much for joining and hanging out with me during those, but we talked a little bit about how someone's childhood significantly impacts what they do and their patterns of behavior as they get older, and today's case is a prime example of that. So let's go ahead and start getting into it. We're going to be talking about two people today, Anne-Marie Fahey and Thomas Capano. Now, Anne-Marie Fahey, she was born in Wilmington, Delaware on January 1st, 1966. She was a happy-go-lucky girl. She loved trivia. She loved doing impressions of people. She was super smart. She had this laugh that, like, even if you were in a crowded bar that was super loud that you couldn't hear the person next to you talking, you could hear her laugh above everything else. She was just a really incredible person. Now, Anne-Marie was the youngest of six kids. She had one sister and four brothers, and she was the youngest by a lot. All of her siblings were a lot older than her, but despite this age gap, they were still really close. And they had a loving family. They all got along. They were just super supportive and in a very good family, a loving and happy and safe home. But when Anne-Marie was eight, her mom got really sick. And then when she was nine, her mom ended up passing away. And this was obviously super hard on her and all of her siblings and her dad especially. And after Anne-Marie's mom died, her dad devolved pretty quickly. He began drinking a lot and just getting really belligerent, really aggressive. And the worst part of it all was that all of Anne Marie's siblings were out of the house at that point. So she was the only one there with her dad. And when he got aggressive, he took it out on her. He didn't physically abuse her, but he was very mentally abusive and emotionally abusive. He would really hone in on her weight and he would call her ugly and fat and just basically tear her down all the time. So that was a really hard thing for her. And then along with having these horrible things being said to her all the time, her dad was so drunk so much of the time that he couldn't keep his job. He wasn't working, he wasn't bringing in money, things were super tight, they were about to lose their home. And at the time, Anne-Marie was babysitting for a family that she'd gotten really close with. This family was related to one of Anne-Marie's friends, and so they knew her really well, they knew everything that was going on, and they invited Anne-Marie to come live with them. And so she took him up on that offer, and they gave her her own room, they treated her basically like family, they wanted her to feel comfortable, they told her, make yourself at home, this is your space, treat it like it's your own. They were so incredibly kind to her, and they were happy to have her there, they really, she was a great young girl, and so... They didn't mind taking her in at all. And Anne-Marie was so grateful to be there, but she was so worried about causing problems that she became really obsessive about keeping her room clean, keeping everything tidy. Like she did not want to cause any stress to this family, any worry to this family. She became pretty withdrawn. Like she just really kept to herself. And the worst part of all of it was that because she was a kid and she wasn't working, she like wasn't bringing in any money for this family, she felt like she couldn't eat as much as she wanted to. She didn't, again, she didn't want to inconvenience anybody and she didn't want them to feel like she was being too much or taking too much. And so she would force herself to leave the table while she was still hungry. And I think that yeah, part of this is because she didn't want to be a burden and she didn't have any money, but another big part of it was because of what her dad would say to her all the time. When he would get drunk, he would call her fat, he would call her ugly, and so it gave her a really weird complex about food. Eventually, though, two of her older brothers ended up getting a home for themselves. They bought a home together and they said, hey, like once we get this all finalized, Anne-Marie, we want you to come live with us you have a room here, you have a place with us. And she ended up being able to do that. 
and that just made her and her siblings even closer, and they remained really close even into adulthood. So despite having this really tough childhood, Anne-Marie was determined to have a good life and be successful as an adult. She put herself through college, she learned Spanish, she studied abroad in Spain for a year. She just really wanted to have a great life and she had big aspirations. Her biggest professional goal was to work in the foreign sector. And in 1993, she was on her way to achieving her goal. She was working in government. Um, she stayed in Delaware and she was working for Governor Tom Carper. She was his scheduling secretary. And this is also the year that she started dating Thomas Capano. And Thomas Capano was from Delaware as well. He was born on October 11th, 1948. And his family was extremely wealthy. His father was a real estate developer and a contractor. And this was during a time in Delaware where they were expanding rapidly. So it was very easy for people in blue collar jobs to make a ton of money. When they had their kids, they just gave them everything they could ever want. They ended up having four sons and one daughter, and they doted on all of them. So Tom went to private school as a kid, and then he went to Boston College as well as Boston Law School, and he ended up marrying his college sweetheart named Kay. They had four kids. They were all girls over the course of their marriage, and it, it seemed like, you know, a, a really great marriage. Tom, you know, he graduated from law school and he had a ton of different positions throughout the course of his career. He was a lawyer at a private law firm. He was a state prosecutor. He was a city attorney. He was a, a professional counsel to a governor and he was also a political consultant. So a lot of these jobs were in local government, meaning they weren't going to be paying him as much as you know, what he would get paid in the private sector. But Tom didn't have to worry about that. You know, he, he took them because they were going to be good for his career, and they were, and that helped him continue moving up and getting new opportunities, making connections, all of that. Um, but, but he really didn't have to worry about not making a ton of money because his parents were still financially supporting him. Even long into his career, even having kids, like, they always wanted to make sure their kids were taken care of and they had a ton of wealth. They had so much money that they just gave their kids money every month to help them not have to worry about anything ever. So Tom appears to have pretty much the perfect life, an ideal life where he gets to work at a job that he's passionate about. He doesn't have to worry about money. He has a beautiful wife. He has amazing daughters. Like, it just seems like he could have everything he ever wanted. But unfortunately, he wanted more. In 1981, he was working in a law firm, and New Year's Eve of that year was when he first approached Deborah McIntyre, who was the wife of one of his co-workers. And he confessed to her that he was very attracted to her and he wanted to be with her. And pretty quickly after that, they started a secret affair that would last nearly 15 years. So Tom's married. He has kids. In 1981, he starts this affair with Deborah, and it's continuing. And now we're at 1993, when Tom starts pursuing Anne-Marie, who is 14 years younger than him. Now, Anne-Marie and Tom had known each other for years before 1993. They both worked in local government. So they'd seen each other at parties, fundraisers, dinners, special events, all that stuff. So they, they each knew who the other person was, but it was on a trip to uh, uh, Governor Tom Carper's office in 1993 when Tom started pursuing her. And at first it didn't seem like he was pursuing her in a romantic way. You know, it was just kind of like an office friendship. They would go to lunch together during the workday, hang out, talk about stuff that was going on in the office and in government, but it pretty quickly turned into having wine at Anne Marie's apartment and going to really expensive dinners out in Philadelphia where no one was gonna recognize who they were. Anne Marie knew that Tom was married, 
but she kind of explained it away as like, oh, we're just friends. Even though we're, we're going to dinner, we're drinking wine together, it's just friends, just a friendship. And she wouldn't even admit it to herself or her friends that it was something more. Even when her friends walked into the living room and saw them cuddled up on the couch together, Anne-Marie would not talk about it. But eventually it got a little bit more serious with Tom starting to buy really expensive presents for Anne-Marie. He would buy her clothes that he knew that she couldn't afford on her own. He bought her a TV. He would buy her pretty much anything she wanted. And he even tried to give her a new car. He was going to be a Lexus. He was like, oh, your car's old. Let me upgrade it for you. And she did end up turning him down for that because I think she knew that it would look really suspicious if someone who I think at the time she was making like $31,000 a year. And so she's like, if I show up with a Lexus, people are going to think it's odd. And even after she turned him down for that, he wanted her to uh, move out of her apartment with her friends and into an apartment by herself that he would pay for. But she also denied this because she really loved her friends and she loved being with them, being close with them, just being able to spend time together with people who understood her. So she did not let him get her her own apartment. And even though Anne-Marie and Tom were in a clearly romantic relationship with each other, she kind of had conflicting feelings about him. It seemed like, yes, she was romantically interested in Tom. They had this relationship, but... He was 14 years older than her, and so it kind of seemed like she saw him as somewhat of a father figure. Tom was one of the only people, and especially one of the only men, who knew about her crippling eating disorder. That disorder that she developed as a kid when they didn't have enough money and when she couldn't provide for herself and she was staying with that family, it followed her into adulthood, and none of her friends knew about it. Her family didn't really know about it. They didn't talk about it. But Tom knew, and he was not afraid to talk to her about it. He would bring it up with her all the time. He would remind her to eat. He would remind her to take her vitamins. And, and we know that he did this a lot because they sent emails back and forth to each other constantly throughout this affair. And it's all on the work computers. So we can see him being like, take your vitamins, remember to go, like, remember to go eat. Are you going to your therapy appointments? All of that. So even though Tom was a secret from a lot of people in her life, some people did know about him, her roommates mainly, and she became really reliant on him. She really depended on him. He was such a huge part of her life. Whenever she was in a crisis, she would call him. If she needed help, if she was feeling scared, you know, she just depended on him. And he liked being there for her. He liked being in that position of, I don't want to say power, but kind of. To It feels powerful to be the one that someone calls when they're scared or when they need you. And Tom loved Anne-Marie just as much as she loved him. He didn't just like being there when she needed him. He liked spending time with her. He liked going out to dinner with her. He really, he really valued her presence. But that didn't stop him from holding his wealth over her or reminding him of how, how wealthy he was and all the connections he had. And he definitely was not always nice to her. So again, they started this affair in 1993. And then in 1995, because her family did not know that she was involved with Tom, her brother Robert decided to introduce Anne-Marie to a man named Michael Scanlon. He was a young banker. He was a really kind person. He was a nice guy. He was stable. And it, Robert thought that he would be a really good match for Anne-Marie. So they met. They hit it off. And it, she realized what a good person he was. And all of her family around realized that he was going to be just a great, stable part of Anne-Marie's life. And they really liked Michael and Anne-Marie together. So she started getting feelings for him, but she was still with Tom at the time. And near the end of that year, Tom started talking to Anne-Marie about how he was going to leave his wife so they could be together. And as much as Anne-Marie did not love the idea of being a mistress, she liked the idea of being someone who caused a man to leave his family and kids even worse. So because he said that, because he was actually talking about doing it and she thought that he might really do it, she decided to break it up with him. She did not want to be the reason that a family broke apart. And I know that it seems kind of odd because you're like, well, you're dating a married man. You already know that you're doing damage to the family. But I think it, for some people, it would take it to a whole new ball game to know that 
you're going to be the reason that they're actually leaving their wife. If they're still with their wife, it's one thing. And as messed up as that sounds, I just think for her, it made it too real because people didn't know about the affair. It was secret. It wasn't something that was common knowledge. And so I don't think the reality of it hit her until he started talking about it. So anyway, Tom said that he was going to leave his wife. Anne Marie said, no, thank you. And she ended up breaking up with him near the end of the year in 1995. But this was unacceptable to Tom. When she broke up with him, he attacked her physically and grabbed her by the throat, called her all sorts of names, and was just generally pissed off. Luckily, in that instance, he did not harm her any more than that, but he went through a period of time right after the breakup where he would call her constantly, he would sit in his car for hours at a time, watching her apartment, waiting for her to come home, and at one point, he even burst into Anne Marie's apartment. She was there, her roommates were all there, and he just started ranting and yelling and taking all of his presents back. Took the TV back, took the CDs back, started grabbing clothes that he bought her. And at one point, according to Kim, Anne Marie's roommate and one of her best friends, he directly said, no man is ever going to see you in that dress I bought you. And even though none of these actions made Anne Marie take Tom back, he did end up leaving his wife. So Tom went through a period of some pretty scary behavior, but despite all of this, Anne Marie never called the police on him. Nor did she tell her new boyfriend, Michael, that she was scared of an ex who was behaving erratically. She did not want any of this to come out. She didn't want anyone to ever know that she'd been involved in this relationship with a married man. And so she kept it quiet. Plus, Deep down in her heart, she still loved Tom. Even though he did all of these bad things, he was really scary, he was really erratic, she had this place in her heart for him because she had been completely honest with him, which was something that she didn't have with most of the people in her life. And so she felt, probably correctly, that he knew her better than anyone else because he knew all of her secrets. Now, despite the fact that Tom had gone through this period of madness, calmed down, stopped following her, stopped watching her apartment, stopped calling her all the time, it didn't mean that he didn't still want her. He very much wanted to restart their relationship, and after a little bit of a cooling down period, he started pursuing her again. He was constantly sending emails to her at work, he was inviting her to dinner, he would continue talking to her about her eating disorder, making sure that she was eating, saying, you know, I'm worried that, you're, that you don't have enough food. Let's go out to dinner. Let me take you. And reminding her about really intimate things, paying for her therapy, reminding her to go to therapy, offering to give her money. Like he was doing whatever he could to get back with Anne Marie. And despite having seen Tom's dark side aimed directly at her, Anne Marie couldn't help but respond to his emails. And there were two reasons for this. One was because deep down she wasn't over him. They had spent, you know, nearly two years together. She loved him. And it, for the most part, he did treat her pretty well. So, you know, I think it's kind of easier to talk yourself out of the negative things that someone has done when you still feel like you love them. And so she had this emotional connection to him, but she was also scared that if she made him mad, he would expose her because he was he was not with his wife at this point, so he didn't really have much to lose by saying that they'd had a relationship. He didn't have anything to lose, but she was terrified that she would lose Michael if Tom spoke out about it, and she was afraid of disappointing her siblings. So she returned these emails, but she was really careful about what she said. She was friendly, but not overly friendly. She, you know, was engaging, but trying to keep her distance without making him mad. And by 1996, Anne believed that she and Tom were in a good place. She thought that he had come to terms with the new normalcy of their relationship, that it's no longer romantic, it's just friendship. And she thought that they could move on from there. But he, of course, saw things differently. He was still trying to win her back, and he even reached out to her friend Kim, who's also her roommate, on multiple occasions talking about how much he wanted Anne Marie back, how much he loved her, saying that he could he could have anybody. Do you know who he is? He could have anyone in the world, but he just wanted Anne Marie. And at one point he even told her, 
Look where she comes from, and I can offer her the entire world. I could buy her anything she wanted. I have more money than I can spend in a lifetime. Am I crazy for going after her? Am I crazy to be in love with this girl? So he was not going to let her go anytime soon, and he continued to be persistent and constantly email her and remind her and the friends that knew about him how much he had to offer her. Eventually, they started spending time together again, and they were pretty quickly back to him buying her these expensive gifts, buying her clothes that he knew that she wanted, taking her out to really expensive dinners, and it seemed like they were pretty quickly falling back into how they were when they were having the affair. Only this time, they weren't sleeping together. Anne-Marie couldn't let him go either. Even though she just wanted this friendship with him, she knew that he wanted more. And it caused her to be really conflicted. And because she was so conflicted, she was anxious and she was tense. And her eating disorder flared up even worse than it had in past times of stress, because that's when it really got bad. When she was stressed out about something, when she was feeling nervous, when she was feeling anxious, she would fall back into that pattern, even if she'd made progress before. And one day at work, she had eaten so little, she was so hungry that she fainted. And when she came to, instead of calling her boyfriend, Michael, she called Tom to pick her up and take her home. And that was because Michael didn't know anything about her eating disorder. Like I said, from the outside, Anne was this super happy-go-lucky person. She loved life. She was so joyful. But so many of those people who thought they knew her best did not know her secrets. She especially didn't want Michael to know about anything negative that she had done or that she was going through because she was afraid that he wouldn't think of her the same way. He would judge her for that and he would see her as being weak or being less than what he originally thought she was. So like I said, they rekindled their friendship. They were hanging out, going out to dinner. It seemed like they were gonna get back to their old dynamic. But in May of 1996, Anne decided that it was time to end things with Tom for good. She wrote in her diary that she realized Tom was a manipulative, jealous, insecure maniac. And she started again making excuses as to why they couldn't hang out, trying to keep him distant, trying not to interact with him too much, but again, not wanting to make him mad. And at this point, she was really focusing on, it's me, not you. You know, she would tell him, I don't feel comfortable going to dinner because of my eating disorder. It makes me feel really uncomfortable. It makes me anxious. It makes me feel like I want to eat even less because I get so nervous going out to dinner. You know, I'm going through a really tough time. I can't do it. Thank you so much. Like, I appreciate you asking, but it's on me. You know, this is my fault. Because she thought that that was going to be the easiest way to kind of get rid of him and let him down and, and make it feel like, you know, she would be with him if she could, but it's just really not a good time and she doesn't want to burden him. But despite all this nothing could deter Tom. He wanted Anne-Marie back, and on June 27th, they went to dinner together in Philadelphia one last time. Of the people who knew about Anne and Tom's relationship, they all think that the only reason she would have gone to dinner with him was to break up with him. According to the waitress who served them at their dinner, they were really awkward they didn't really have much to say to each other. Neither of them were eating their food. They did have a few drinks, but they barely touched their meals. And the waitress came over to ask, is everything okay? Is it to your liking? And she was really quickly shooed away. But they weren't, you know, they didn't want to talk to her, but they also weren't talking to each other. And so it was just a really awkward, tense meal. After they were done at the restaurant, they had their leftovers wrapped up and they took them out to the car with them. And Tom took Anne-Marie back to the home that he'd been renting since his divorce and he killed her. There's no official murder weapon and no one has ever found Anne-Marie's body. But that night was the last night anyone saw her alive. Three days later, she was supposed to go to a dinner at her brother Robert's house with Michael. You know, she was going to spend time with Robert, his wife, her sister, her sister's family, and they were all going to get together and have a good time. But Anne-Marie didn't show up, and so they reported her missing. 
This launched an investigation that lasted several years and ended with the conclusion that this was the most likely series of events. Several weeks before his dinner with Anne Marie, Tom had asked his longtime and still current mistress, Deborah, to purchase a gun for him. And Deborah didn't have any firearms. She didn't have any experience. The, the whole thought of it made her really nervous, especially because she found out that it's illegal to purchase a gun with the intent of giving it to someone else. And she, she just, she didn't want to do it, but she had proven time and time again that she would do anything for Tom. And she didn't know what he was going to do with it, but he told her that he was being threatened. He was being blackmailed. He needed it for protection because he was scared of whoever this person was that was trying to harass him. So she bought it and she gave it to him. Now on the night of the murder, there's no indication of whether this was the result of a fight, of a breakup, if he just surprised her and did it, but Tom shot Anne Marie, supposedly with the gun that Deborah purchased, and then stuffed Anne Marie's five foot 10 body into a cooler, likely breaking multiple bones. At some point after this, he took both sets of leftovers over to Anne Marie's apartment and placed them in the kitchen and left, likely to draw suspicion away from himself. So that way, if somebody knew that they'd gone out to dinner, he could say, no, I took her home. You know, her, her leftovers should be there. So the next day, Tom called his brother, Jerry, and said that he needed Jerry to take him out on his boat and that he needed to do it as soon as possible. And the thing about this is that a few weeks before this, Tom had told Jerry that he needed to borrow a shotgun. Jerry had several guns and Tom said he needed it for the same reason he told Deborah. He was being blackmailed, he was being threatened, he was being harassed. He needed it to protect himself. And so his brother was like, yeah, sure, here you go, you can have it. So he gave it to Tom and then a little while later, Tom ended up giving it back and Jerry could tell that the gun hadn't been fired. So I think that he probably asked Deborah and Jerry for the guns around the same time, and he knew that Deborah was nervous about it, so he was just getting the shotgun as a backup. But who knows? In any case, he gave it back to Jerry, and it hadn't been shot. However, considering all of this, Jerry did not want to take his brother out on the boat. He didn't know what Tom needed to be on the boat for on such short notice, but he knew his brother well enough to know that he did not want any part of it. However, the brothers were really close and Tom had a history of bailing all of his younger brothers out of trouble whenever they got into anything. Tom was the good brother. He was the one who became a lawyer. He had a really respectable position and all the boys did well for themselves. But they all kind of got into some shady stuff along the way. And so Tom was the one who always rescued them. And now it was time for Jerry to return the favor. Pay me back, take me out on the boat. So Jerry relented. They went up to the New Jersey coast and got on Jerry's boat and then went 62 miles out from shore. This is where they threw the cooler that Anne Marie's body was in into the water and waited for it to sink which it did not. So at this point, they retrieved the cooler from the water, brought it back onto the boat, uh, removed Anne Marie's body from the cooler, and Tom shot a hole in it, then took two anchors off of Jerry's boat and wrapped them around Anne Marie's body and threw them each into the water separately. After this, they went back to Tom's rental home where Jerry helped Tom get rid of a couch and some carpet that was covered in Anne Marie's blood. They ended up taking it to a property that was owned by their other brother, Lewis. They threw this stuff in the dumpster and then they called their brother Lewis and told him that they were going to need him to uh, call the garbage service and uh, schedule an additional pickup outside of the regular service. So he did that and then after the container was dumped, Tom thought that he was going to be in the clear. Unfortunately for Tom, though, the police immediately found him suspicious. They were questioning him. They were searching his home. They were looking into him from the get-go, 
and then on July 4th of that same year, 1996, the cooler was found by another fisherman who turned it into the police. And even though the cooler didn't have Anne Marie's body in it, because the police were already investigating Tom, they had access to his financial records, they could see all the purchases that he'd made within the past few months, they were able to link that cooler to Tom. He had purchased an igloo cooler several months before the murder even occurred. And because they were able to do that, Tom became their official suspect. They knew that he was most likely the person who harmed her, if not killed her. And as they further investigated Tom, some pretty unsettling stuff came out about him. Uh, specifically the fact that in 1980, Tom had allegedly hired a man to threaten and harass a legal secretary who had refused Tom's advances. Allegedly, he told the man to hurt the bitch, and the secretary was so terrified that she ended up having to leave her job. And that's just one example of the ways that Tom had abused his power, had abused his influence, and used his money, his wealth, and his social standing to control what other people did. Now, throughout the investigation, Tom had counted on Deborah, Lewis, and Jerry to not say anything. He thought that he had total control over them, they owed him for all the stuff that he'd done, and he expected that they would keep their mouths shut. However, all three of them agreed to testify against Tom. And while Tom was being held in jail awaiting his trial, he approached another inmate with the request to hire someone to have Deborah killed. Luckily, that inmate was an informant and they were able to prevent anything from being set up or anything bad from happening to Deborah. And really, all this did was add more fuel to the prosecution's fire. This just gave more proof, more backing that Tom was the type of person who was capable of doing something like this. So the state took Tom to trial and on January 17th, 1996, Thomas Capano was found guilty of Anne Marie's murder. The jury recommended that he be sentenced to death, and the judge considered it and agreed that that should be his sentence. It's incredible that they were able to get a conviction on something like this, something where, you know, they, they knew that Deborah had bought this gun. She admitted that she bought it. Tom denied that she bought it for him. He never confessed to anything. He never said he took part of it. They never found the gun that he used to shoot Anne Marie, and they never found her body. But they were able to bring up so much evidence about this person, so many sketchy, illegal, harmful things he'd done in the past that despite not having that, they still got a conviction. And not only that, but so many people, not everyone on the jury, but the majority voted that he should be put to death. However, in 2006, uh, Tom did appeal his conviction, and the Delaware Supreme Court decided that since it was not a unanimous jury decision, they would go ahead and overturn the death penalty on his sentence, and instead he would just be sentenced to life in prison without parole. But a few years later, on September 19th, 2011, Tom was found dead in his jail cell. And this was likely due to heart failure. According to Judge Lee, the one who presided over Tom's court case, when Tom started being tried, he kind of let himself go. He started eating a lot. He was really rapidly gaining weight. And heart failure and heart disease runs within Tom's family. So the judge wasn't surprised to hear that at all. He said, you know, I saw him start to decline as we went through the trial. So I literally think he ate himself to death is essentially what the judge said. And about the death, Anne Marie's brother, Robert said he killed Anne Marie. He murdered Anne Marie 15 years ago. He had the benefit of solitary confinement for 15 years. She was robbed of her life. So it was clearly long overdue. And with that, we come to the end of the story about Anne-Marie Fahey and Thomas Capano, a man who wouldn't be content with owning the moon, with holding the stars in his hand. He would not be happy. He always wanted more. He always wanted to show his power, get more, take more, exercise his social standing, his money, his power over people, 
that he deemed were less than him. And as far as Anne Marie goes, it's just tragic. She fell into this relationship because she didn't feel worthy, because she didn't feel like she was enough, because she had this trauma and she had a longing to be taken care of and the wrong person saw that and took advantage of it. In doing the research for this week's episode, it was really hard to find a ton of information about Anne Marie. Most of the time when you Google it, you're going to see articles and articles and articles written about Tom. Tom's story, Tom's background. It's just, it's all about him. And the main way that I was able to get information about Anne Marie, her life, her childhood, who she was as a person was through Anne Rule's book, I Never Let Her Go, Thomas Capano, The Deadly Seducer. It's an incredible book. And if this story interested you enough that you want to read a book about it, I would definitely recommend that. I will have an Amazon link in the description. However, I was able to read it on an app called Libby, not sponsored, but it's just a free app that connects to your library. So if you have a library card, you can put your info in there. You can rent digital books, audiobooks, magazines, all that. So, I mean, it was available in my library. If you're interested in checking it out, definitely do that because it's free. But having said all that, Definitely let me know what you thought of this story, if you'd heard of it before, if you think that it is just incredible the fact that they were able to get a conviction despite not having the murder weapon and not having her body. I think it is truly amazing work, not only on the part of the detectives and the investigators, but especially on the prosecution to be able to prove to people without a doubt that he did it, that they, that he, there is enough evidence to convict this person of such a horrible crime. Thank you so much for watching. I would love it so much if you would consider liking this video or subscribing to my channel. And if you've subscribed already, thank you so much. I'm so appreciative of you. I love being able to just sit here, hang out and talk about whatever. And if you have a suggestion for a future video, definitely click the survey link that is in my description. You'll have the option to pick what type of video you want and then there's a box underneath that you can put all the information in. Again, thank you so much for watching. Please be kind to people and I will see you in the next one. Bye.